the glory of the risen Lord Who can compare With the beauty of the Lord Forever He will be The Lamb upon the throne Gladly bow the knee and worship him, my Lord. I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord who once was slain. Reconcile man to God Forever you will be The Lamb upon the throne I gladly bow the knee And worship you alone Good morning. And welcome to worship once more as we continue our celebration of Jesus' resurrection and its importance for us all in our daily lives. I trust, therefore, that since Easter Day, you've managed to have a balanced diet, which I'm told on good authority means having a chocolate egg in each hand. So if you're in the mood of the volition or the need, feel free to raise your hands in worship and even dance for the Lord. There is nothing at all that says we need to be welded to our seats in worship. And indeed, arguably, it would be quite sad if we felt unable to get up out of our seat to worship Christ, wouldn't it? Today, we're looking at the story of Thomas and his experience of Jesus being risen and encouraging one another to make sure that we don't miss out on seeing Jesus for ourselves. Friends, shall we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for the message of Easter, the assurance that life is not in vain, that love is not blotted out, that faith is not futile. We praise you that death is not the end, but a new beginning, a gateway to heaven, a door unto untold blessings you hold in store for us. Receive the worship we offer you today and teach us to live each day in the light of your Easter triumph. Risen Lord, lead us from death to life for your name's sake. Amen. Yeah. 
Friends, we have our opening prayers. Gracious God, we thank you that our faith is not founded on theory or speculation, merely on the idea of theologians or the musings of philosophers. It is rooted in what individuals have seen and heard, in the living testimony of ordinary people like us, in the witness of countless generations of believers who have encountered the risen Christ for themselves through his Spirit. In him you came, you lived, you died, you rose again, making yourself known through the concrete events of history, for all who saw for themselves and passed the message on, receive our thanks, and for all that we experience today of your continuing love and life-giving purpose, we give you our praise in joyful worship, all through Jesus Christ, our risen, victorious Saviour. Sovereign God, we may not understand how you raised Jesus from the dead, how you breathed life into his body, how you rolled the stone away from the tomb, how he appeared unrecognised to Mary in the garden, and to disciples on the Emmaus Road, how he walked through locked doors to be with the apostles, how he repeatedly appeared from nowhere to stand among his followers. What we do understand is this, that he changed the lives of all who met him, turning their sorrow into celebration, their despair into faith, and that he is with us now through his life-giving spirit remaking our lives in turn, giving us joy, peace and a sense of purpose such as we never imagined possible before. We may not understand, but we believe. And we rejoice and we offer you our grateful worship in the name of the same Jesus, our risen Lord Saviour. Lord Jesus Christ, you appeared to different people at different places at different times. Each had their own unique encounter with you. And it was only when you met with them, face to face, that the truth dawned. Only then that they dared to believe that you were alive. Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot see you quite as they did, but we too can meet with you and experience the reality of your living presence. Meet with us now as we worship you. Live in us always, so that our lives might resound to your praise and your glory. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I don't know if you can see the shirt I'm wearing, but I'm pleased to say, actually, I've had this shirt since 1999. It is almost as old as my son, and it is still in reasonably good condition. It's not the oldest piece of clothing I have. I have a jumper which goes back to 1986, which I'm quite chuffed about, although to be fair, it has a little bit of paint over it these days, and is only really usable for, for garage and gardening. But the story I want to tell you about is a man who was a beggar who met a king who gave him some new clothes. No, it's not that story. This one, I think, is a different one. So, we have the story of the beggar and the king. There were, you see, there was a beggar who lived near the king's palace. And one day he saw a proclamation posted on the outside of the palace gate. The king was giving a great dinner, and anyone dressed in royal garments was invited to the party. The beggar went on his way. He looked at the rags he was wearing and sighed. Surely only kings and their families wore such royal robes, he thought. But slowly, 
an idea crept into his mind. The audacity of it made him tremble. Would he dare? He made his way back to the palace and he approached the guard at the gate. Please, sir, he said, I'd like to speak to the king. Wait here, the guard replied, and in a few minutes he was back. His majesty will see you, he said, and led the beggar in. You wish to see me? asked the king. Yes, your majesty, I want so much to attend the banquet, but I have no royal robes to wear. Please, sir, if I may be so bold, may I have one of your old garments so that I too may come to the banquet? The beggar shook so hard he couldn't see the faint smile that was on the king's face. You've been wise in coming to me, the king said, and he called to his son, the young prince. Take this man to your room and array him in some of your clothes. The prince did, just as he was told, and soon the beggar was standing before a mirror, clothed in garments that he'd never dare hope for. You are now eligible to attend the king's banquet tomorrow, said the prince. But even more important, you will never need any other clothes. These garments will last forever. The beggar dropped to his knees. He said, oh, thank you, he cried. But as he started to leave, he looked back at his pile of dirty rags on the floor and he hesitated. What if the prince was wrong? What if he would need his old clothes again? Quickly, he gathered them up and took them with him. The banquet was far greater than he'd ever imagined, but he couldn't enjoy himself as he should. He had made a small bundle of his old rags and it kept falling out of his lap. The food was passed quickly and the beggar missed some of the greatest delicacies. Time proved that the prince, however, was right. The clothes did last forever. But still the poor beggar grew fonder and fonder of his old rags. As time passed, people seemed to forget the royal robes he was wearing. They saw only the little bundle of filthy rags, rags that he clung to wherever he went. They even spoke of him as the old man with the rags. One day, as he lay dying, the king visited him. The beggar saw the sad look on the king's face when he looked at the small bundle of rags by the bed. Suddenly, the beggar remembered the prince's words and he realised that his bundle of rags had cost him a lifetime of true royalty. He wept bitterly at his mistake. And you know what? The king wept with him. You see, we've been invited through Christ into a royal family, dressed, as they say, in robes we cannot deserve. That is the family of God to a feast at God's dinner table. And all we have to do is shed our old rags and put on these new clothes of faith, which are provided through God's son himself, Jesus Christ. But we can't hold on to all our old rags and think things stay the same. When we put our faith in Jesus, we must let go of the sin and the sadness and the old ways of living. Those things must be disregarded if we are to experience the true royalty and abundant life in Christ that is on offer to us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Behold, the old is passed away, the new has come. Friends, think of the old rags to which you cling, the old ways, even the old ways of faith. And ask, are they leading you to Christ and into that royal life, that godly life? Or are they holding you back? Let go of what stains you, what detracts from your faith, but cling to that which leads you to God.
Thanks be to him. Amen. Our reading today follows on from the beginning of John chapter 20 with the appearance of Jesus to the women at the tomb. We have verses 19 to 31 in which Jesus presents himself as the risen saviour to his disciples and then subsequently to Thomas as well. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas this time was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Yet blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John tells us, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in his book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. Amen. You know, if we're honest, none of us really like the idea of missing out, do we? That's why there's always such a rush for big events. That's why everybody is holding out for their vaccine and their second dose. That's why we register for things so far in advance. Why we binge watch so much television these days. You know, it's like the BBC iPlayer says, making the unmissable unmissable. So when Jesus appears to the disciples and Thomas isn't there, we can only imagine how he felt, realising what we may have missed, what he may have missed, wondering why Jesus came and we weren't there. Asking what was so important that kept him from meeting Jesus that day. It's so easy to feel in those scenarios that others are preferred by God over us and we feel unwanted, unloved, pushed to the edge. We don't know where Thomas was, but what we do know is that when his friends next see him, they try hard to tell him that Jesus is alive. But because he wasn't there, he doubts. He maybe looked at the calendar and thought, ah, this is an April Fool, guys, come on. So he finds it hard to believe and wants proof. He himself needs to see and to touch Jesus. And when we're faced with the possibility of missing out, we have two possibilities, don't we? Of course, it all depends on what we're missing out on. 
On the one hand, it might be a rise in pay. On the other hand, it might be a dose of chicken pox, you know, as to our eagerness. And it does make a difference. But how much more would you feel that you'd missed out on something special if you thought you'd missed out on meeting Jesus? It is actually, I think, the church's greatest worry that we won't be ready for the end times, that we won't see it happen in our in our minds and our lives. And as one author puts it, we are at risk of being left behind. So we have a couple of options. The first is, like the establishment, the Sanhedrin, we might do nothing. Well, we'll come back to them shortly, I think. Or secondly, we might do what Thomas did and be honest and ask Jesus to reveal himself to him. I mean, after all, Jesus has already appeared to the other disciples. Why shouldn't he appear again? And why shouldn't he appear to Thomas this time? So when Jesus appears again, once more it might be added in that locked room and Thomas is there, we see what happens. We can see that the other disciples didn't push Thomas away going, ah, you're on the outside, mate. Too late, you missed your chance. They wanted Thomas to stay with them and wanted Thomas to see Jesus for himself. And they hoped and they prayed that it would happen. I recognise and I repent that I as a preacher and, and I'm sure others have often treated Thomas harshly. It has to be remembered, of course, that the other disciples already had their proof when they sought to convince him. John seems to include this account, not because Thomas is an exception, but because he's so typical. That is, he reacts with the same doubts uh, that all the disciples have displayed at one time or another. And so in the reading, Thomas isn't treated harshly, either by Jesus or by John. And so therefore, nor should we. We can make, th make ourselves think that it's not important, however, that everyone experiences Jesus for themselves. That instead, that it's okay to believe in those who believe in Jesus. And in so doing, they themselves are saved. However, of course, it's important for Jesus that Thomas believes firsthand that he's alive, that he is risen, so that he may, we're told, stop doubting and believe. And that belief is not a case of subscribing to a, a few doctrines or words. It's actually a belief in our heart, a belief in Thomas's heart, in which he can then put his faith in Jesus. So it's therefore equally important for us too that we experience the risen Christ for ourselves so that we too will be able to stop doubting and believe. Thomas, we're told, professed his faith there and then. My Lord and my God, he says. And they did so through seeing Jesus himself. It wasn't about touching him. Jesus had to say, here, put your hand here, touch me, show, you know, put your hand in my side. Thomas saw Jesus and he believed, we're told. Jesus came so that Thomas wouldn't miss out or be left behind. And Jesus comes to us today so that we won't miss out and we won't be left behind either. He wants us to be certain and to be sure that we have the assurance of that salvation through his death on the cross and over death itself. Because once you're sure that you're not missing out on Jesus, then there is a second question, which cannot be answered until you have answered the first. And the second question is, who else is missing out? And what can I do about it? See, the difficulty for us as Christians is we often put that question before the first. We often try and say, actually, who is missing out and what can I do about it? Rather than saying, am I missing out? Jesus says, see and believe. Have faith that you're not missing out or left behind. 
And then you will have faith to share with those who are missing out, who are at risk of being left behind. So Jesus appeared to them as individuals and yet the commission is given to them on an equal basis. They are all to go and make disciples. Why? So that none in the world shall miss out on knowing Jesus is alive. Just as the Father sent him, so Jesus sends his disciples. So Jesus sends us into the world. And it's this close experience of him and his commission that is therefore not for the few, not for the enthusiastic, outgoing people in our congregations alone, but for us all, for the great many. We read today not only of Thomas and Peter and John, but actually when we look forward into the book of Acts, we see that all of the apostles were arrested at one time or another. Why? Because they had filled Jerusalem with their story of Jesus' death and resurrection. You see, there's no such thing as a silent witness unless you're watching a TV programme. We all know what kind of witness that is. It is in the conviction that Jesus is alive and that he provides that forgiveness for us in our sins that we can then share something with others. Jesus says, once we stop doubting, and we believe, that's when we have a story to tell. When in our hearts we know that we are loved by Jesus, we will know that we're forgiven by him. And that sense of security and longing to share overflows and bursts from us naturally. We don't need to make an effort. We don't need to force it out. It just happens. You see, Jesus doesn't have favourites. However, he does have some followers who will listen more than the rest. He does have some followers who will respond more readily than the rest and some who are more faithful than the rest. Which is how we come to find the apostles standing before the Sanhedrin, those arguably with their heads in the sand. The disciples, the apostles, are charged with telling all of Jerusalem about how Jesus is the Messiah who was killed by the very Sanhedrin they stand before, and yet is alive again to prove how wrong they were and how right he was. What a charge to make. But like the old saying goes, was there enough evidence to convict them? And if we're in their shoes, accused of being followers of Jesus, is there enough evidence to convict us of following him? Some of the wise ones had anticipated the Messiah's arrival. However, as so often happens, they miss the small print. You know, those little words in about 0.5 script on a box that we all see and then ignore. This product may vary from what's on the picture on the box due to ongoing developments. It wasn't what they were expecting, and so they missed out. And it happens so often, doesn't it? You know, you know. I, take children eating vegetables. How often do we tell them how great sweet corn is, or how how great carrots are, and and all the rest of it? And they go, Ugh, no, I'm not eating that. But it's not just about being good for you. It's actually being good to enjoy itself. It wasn't what they expected, wasn't what they wanted, and so they missed out by rejecting it. And I think there's a little bit of me worries that the Sanhedrin represented the establishment and they were the one group who were most at risk of missing out on the love and the forgiveness that God was offering them through Jesus. You see, they are God's own people. And it's a sobering thought that when Peter and John say they must obey God and not man, they are saying this to God's leaders in their own time. And we mustn't repeat their mistakes. 
We mustn't defend any part of our lives or indeed any part of the church that fails to serve the commission that Jesus has given us. We can't be satisfied with the status quo. We mustn't allow we must allow him into our hearts more and more. Because the establishment is only as obedient as the people in it, you and I. And right now, my fear is that the church is missing out hugely. We fail to recognise God at work. We fail to see the Holy Spirit in action. And we miss that people are responding to Jesus. And these were all the charges that the apostles laid at the Sanhedrin 2,000 years ago. How sure are we that we are still a movement of people and not merely a portfolio of property? We must choose whether we stand accused by God or by man. And we must choose to obey God even above people. However, the good news is that Thomas shows us that all is possible when we stop doubting and believe. When we obey God over man and fulfil our commission to proclaim the good news that Jesus is alive. The whole of Jerusalem, we're told, was filled with people hearing and responding to Jesus. Which is what we want, isn't it? We can forget that Jesus is with us till the end of the age. That Jesus wants to meet you, not only in the past, in the early days of your faith, but today and every coming day. If we will follow, Christ will lead. Jesus does not want you or anyone else else to be left behind. He wants you to have more and more of him. Desire him. Search for him with all your heart. Be open to him and you will find him. On that day, on that night, Thomas declared, Jesus, my Lord and my King. Such was his conviction that tradition has it that Thomas went as far as India and that when the earliest Western missionaries arrived and announced they were bringing Jesus, the locals praised God and said, Welcome, brother. He's already been here before you, thanks to Thomas. Thomas stopped doubting and believed. And therefore, by reputation, millions of other people have stopped doubting and believed. They have known that Jesus is alive. I wonder, what will we do to stop our doubting and to believe? And then also to ask, who else is still missing out on Christ? Lord, guide our steps and our hearts, we pray. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. 
His body lay, light of the world by darkness lay, then bursting forth. prayers in which there'll be a prompt and a response on screen and this prayer will be followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, it is hard to believe in you sometimes, hard to believe in the message you preached, the victory of love you proclaimed, the victory in the way of sacrifice and denial that you urged us to follow. There is so much in life which challenges our faith, speaking instead of the way of self, of greed and avarice, of evil, injustice and exploitation. Yet you rose again from the tomb, triumphant over the darkness. Your love could not be defeated, so may the truth turn our doubt to faith. We look at the course of human history, and time after time it is the same. A catalogue of hatred and violence, evil and oppression. A world in which the strongest survive and the wickest prosper. And the innocent are led like lambs to the slaughter. Yet you rose again from the tomb, triumphant over the darkness. Your love could not be defeated. So may that truth turn our doubt to faith. We look at the world today, and still it's the same story. Nations racked by division and war, an economic order in which the few indulge their very craving, while the many are deprived of even their most basic needs. An international system in which money outweighs principle. A world of drugs, rape, vandalism, child abuse. All this and so much more which scars the face of society. Yet you rose again from the tomb, triumphant over the darkness. Your love could not be defeated. So may that truth turn our doubt to faith. Give us a new heart today through the message of Easter. Help us to remember that your death made no sense to your followers, that violence appeared to be triumphant, goodness crushed and evil victorious. Everything they had lived for seemingly sealed in the tomb and your faith replaced by confusion. 
yet remind us too that you rose again and at your coming the clouds were lifted and the darkness was dispelled and faith began to shoot again. Your love could not be defeated. So may that truth turn our doubt to faith. Lord Jesus Christ, it is hard to believe in you sometimes. For, the, for there are no easy answers to the harsh realities of life. No glib explanations as to why suffering is allowed to continue, evil to go unchecked and good to be unrewarded. But you have shown us through your resurrection that whatever it may face, love will not finally be extinguished and your purpose cannot be denied. One day we shall see your will be done and see your kingdom come. For your love could not be defeated. So may that truth turn our doubt to faith. This we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's share the grace to conclude. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen.